All right, this week we are going to talk about Immanuel Kant and his German philosophy and his German ethics. But before we do that, let's review for a second. <clears throat> we just finished with utilitarianism, which puts the emphasis on the results, the emphasis on outcome. And that's all that really matters. Your reasoning, your intentions, they really play no role in the process of figuring out what I should and should not do. On a complete different end of the scale, you have Immanuel Kant, who is a contemporary of Bentham, as well as John Stuart Mill, who is in Germany, and he is reasoning in a vastly different way, but he's not responding necessarily to them. He is responding to another Englishman, specifically a Scottishman, who, whose skepticism has aroused his process, aroused his rethinking of philosophy, and that philosopher's name is David Hume. David Hume was arguing that we cannot fully know anything for certain. He is saying that we can only know impressions, we can only know ideas, and we cannot know anything for certain. And the result is that there are no metaphysics, there's no ethics, and really there's no science as a result of that. Now, that is a huge challenge to the Enlightenment who believes that through rationalism, through even empiricism, and, and through their reasoning process that they can know things and can develop science and can bring a, an orderliness to the world. So as a result, this skepticism threatens the whole Enlightenment project. Now, my, Immanuel Kant, reading the work of David Hume, and he is responding to the work of David Hume, and he realizes that a vast shift uh, within philosophy is required. He calls it a Copernicum shift, meaning the equally worldview-changing shift that came through Copernicus. Philosophy needs the same thing, a shift in metaphysics. And as a result of his work, that's exactly what happens. You have a pre-Kantian and a post-Kantian shift in metaphysics. So what we mean by metaphysics, as we have it here, a priori knowledge, meaning knowledge apart from experience, things that you can know just by thinking about it. We also mean things like math and logic, again, things that you know by thinking about it, reasoning through it. It includes things like the self, right, the, the idea that I'm a unique self. Uh, with a temperament and a personality uh, that we call the self. We cannot third person uh, observe. It's something that we reason through and experience and know first person. The possibility of free will. Again, this is something that we reason through. It's not something that we empirically can quantify. Moral principles which applies to our subject, uh, and the existence of God. So as you see, we have a, a, we're going to see a big shift from the utilitarians that say consequence, consequences or results are all that matter. For Kant, he is saying that our reasoning process, our metaphysics, are really all that matter. Ultimately, what Kant came to, to realize about uh, human nature is that we have a human nature that has a consistent reasoning process. Uh, he says that the mind is really the, the focus, the, the way that the human mind reasons, the, the way that the human mind is structured, that allows us to, to, to put the emphasis of both metaphysics 
and science, as well as ethics on a consistent playing field so that we can all do it in the same way. We, we, we aren't necessarily all the same in experiences, but we are all the same in the sense of the, the, the structures of our mind. And so this shift that occurs is a focus upon the subject doing the reasoning rather than upon the objects that we are trying to quantify. It is our rational faculties that give us the opportunity and the ability to say that there are that there is science, that there are ethics, that there is free will. All of those are required in order to make such claims. So, as a result, our duties, our moral obligations can be reasoned through that allow us to, to say that there are universal duties, universal, and they're, and they're consistent. Uh, and so we can say that, that there is such a thing as ethical duties, which is in opposition to what David Hume is saying. David Hume is saying there's no such thing as ethics. Uh, there are facts, not values. Kant, on the other hand, is saying that the reason leads us to duties. He says anything that is not based upon that, that is based upon what I want or based upon, um, you know, anything that is outside of reason is going to be flawed. So, metaphysics are a priori. Ethics, therefore, are a priori. They can be found through the reasoning process. And so the question he asked, kind of the beginning point for what he's asking us to, to as a reasoning process, is a test of consistency. What if everybody did that? Would I like somebody else doing that? Right, so... If we ask the question, what if everybody did that, uh, would we, and then the follow-up, would we achieve our goals? He's not asking for outcome-related reasoning. He is saying, if everybody took that approach, particularly an ethical approach, would we achieve our goals in a goal-oriented world? For example, if everybody say, drove the way I drive, would we all arrive at the place that we want to arrive at? Now, if I'm observing some universal duties, meaning I do the speed limit and I stop at the stop signs and I wait for my turn, then yes, we're all going to arrive at work and at school and where we need to arrive or home. What he's saying is we cannot make exceptions for ourselves uh, in the process of our ethical reasoning. Uh, the exceptions to rules are what demolish the, 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 the reasoning process. So it has to be fair and it has to be consistent. It's fair in that it's based upon capabilities that we all have as humans, meaning we have reasoning ability, and we are testing that consistency of it by, by looking through it through the lens of what he's ultimately going to call the, our categorical imperatives. Now, for example, he is opposed to the golden rule, not because he's opposed to religion or the Bible or anything of that nature. He's opposed to it as being a good test of consistency. So the golden rule says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you or treat others the way you want to be treated. What that does is it places the, the test of consistency in what I want. Would I want people to treat me that way? And the problem with that is, according to Kant, is our wants could vary. Do we all have the same wants? Do we have the same needs? Do we all desire the same thing? And the answer is no, which means that my want isn't a very good test of consistency and so he says we should put our test of consistency in something that does not allow immoral acts, that is not variable, that is not inconsistent. 
And so it has to be placed in reasoning and not desire. So at the heart of his test of consistency and fairness, we have a he is asking us to universalize our principles or our maxims, as he is going to say. We're, he's asking us to say, this is what I'm trying to achieve in this particular way. And if it is universalized, meaning all people everywhere of all time do it in this way, and then we test it through that lens and see, can it be achievable? Can our goals be achievable? So first of all, he says, let's look at our maxims. A maxim is a principle that one gives to oneself. Okay, um, It is the thinking process that I am working through. And we have to test our maxims through the lens of its universal ability. Right? Can I universalize my maxim? For example, can I, can I you know, is my maxim say, for example, I should help people in need? Can I universalize that? Should everybody help people in need? Is that a is that a maxim that creates a goal-oriented world? In fact, it does. If people help other people in need, then we all ultimately achieve our goals, whatever they may be. So, to determine what to do, formulate your maxim. Imagine a world in which everyone supports and acts upon that maxim, then can the goal of my action be achieved in such a world? If the answer is yes after that, then it is now a duty because reason has led us to say that we should do it. And so determining what we should do, we are working through, we are clearly identifying our maxim, we are universalizing our maxim, and we are testing that universability against a goal-oriented world. One of his test cases is called the lying promise. Can I lie to a friend to get to what, get what I want? Or can I lie in order to escape from being hurt? Or can I lie to get what I want? In such a world, a, a maxim that says I can lie to get what I want, whether it's avoiding harm or achieving something else, um, or even just not wanting to hurt somebody else's feeling. I lie when it benefits me. Right? And, and so if that's my maxim, if I universalize that, what if everybody lies? Well, if everybody lies to benefit themselves, do we achieve the goals that we are aiming to achieve? And in fact, the answer to that is no. Uh, that would be a very ineffective world because all of a sudden we can't trust each other. There's no point in going to the doctor. There's no point in going to school. There's no point in um, having relationships because if lying is at the heart of that, then the trust relationship is destroyed and therefore the lying promise is not universalizable. It's not something that is effective. There are a few challenges, and we'll talk more about these later, but one of them is the amoralist that says, I should really only do things if I get something out of it. If I'm not getting something out of it, then I shouldn't do it. Um, the, the, the problem is, um, reason does tell us that we have duties, whether we're getting something out of it or not. Reason leads us to do it. So, in response, Kant comes up with the hypothetical imperatives, meaning it's a command of reason, but it's to get what I want. And, and most things in life fall under this heading of it's a hypothetical imperative. I, I do it because that's what I want to get out of it. Okay, I want to lose weight, then I'm going to eat more vegetables or something of that nature. It's basically an if-then statement. If I want something, then I should do it. But we cannot universalize uh, such things. However, ethics falls under the category of categorical imperatives, which are commands of reason that are intrinsically good, that are universal, 
uh, that become our ethical duties, and he states it in this way, act on that maxim whereby you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. What he's saying is let's, if we filter our maxims, our principles, our proposed duties, if we filter them through a universe, you know, if they become a universal law of nature and it functions well, even at that elevated level, then we now have a duty. For example, a, a universal law of nature would be something like gravity. Does gravity ever have an exceptions here on Earth as we are operating right now? No, right? Are there other times? Do we have we learned more about it? Yes, but as it functions, gravity is at play at all times, and it helps us to achieve a, a world that we can actually live in. Okay, Kant is, is putting our ethical principles upon that same level of there are no exceptions, and if we can reason our way through, I have a principle, it is universal and it can be universalized, therefore I now have a duty to do it no matter what. So he has three forms to try to talk us through this. Act only on that maxim which, whereby you can at the same time that it should become a universal law, number one. Uh, number two, same thing, act as if the maxim of your actions were to become, by your will, a universal law of nature. This is where he's saying, um, let, let's observe the world around us. Are there laws of nature that are at all always at functioning, always at work? Yes. Do we, we want to raise our ethical principles to that level? The third one, in order to, I think, mitigate some of the critique of, of Kant, Act so that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in that of another, always as an end and never as a means. Basically, it means we, we have to treat people as universally valuable. We cannot use them to get what we want. So this one is to show, it's trying to, to, to mute some of the, the critique that Kant comes under. And, and I'll try to make a video about the critiques of this as well where he is saying we can't use our ethics to harm people because really the, the, at the core of his metaphysics is the person and their reasoning process. And so people are valuable. In fact, they are priceless to him. Uh, it is the humanity that, that is of utmost value. And he goes on to define humanity as both rational and free. It is our free will and the use of our humanity that gives us that value. And in fact, the way that we figure out what we should and shouldn't do is through our humanity exercising rationality and our free will. So we cannot use people to get what we want. Uh, we have to treat people, treat humanity, always as an end, meaning intrinsically valuable, and never as a means, or in other words, to get what we want. We can't use people to get what we want. So ultimately Kant is asking us to use our reasoning ability, formulate our principles, and evaluate the consistency of those principles on a level that is universal, that applies to all people, all places, everywhere. So that's at the core, at the heart of understanding what Immanuel Kant is trying to achieve. Moving away from utility, addressing the skepticism of Hume, and showing that, in fact, it is entirely rational to be moral. Morals and rationality go hand in hand. In fact, you, you find an argument um, similarly related to that, that irrationality of immorality, right? It is, in fact, irrational to be immoral. If you're irrational, then you're consistent. If you're consistent, then you obey the principles of universal ability. If you obey those principles, then you act morally. 
Therefore, if you are rational, you act morally. If you are immoral, you act irrational. The logic holds fairly tightly. Okay, that it is rational to be moral and it is irrational to be immoral, based upon the tests of consistency that Kant puts forward. So this is the first part. This will be a two-part series. This is the, the basis of and the reasoning process. What we will have to do is talk more about his view of humanity, as well as what the ultimate aim is, which is what he calls the goodwill. And we will pick that up in another video.